Okay, I think we're going to make a start. So the ones who haven't got out of bed early enough will have to creep in embarrassingly at the back. So today's session, session HF, is on IMS Continuous Delivery, Future Trends and Directions. Uh, and as you probably already know, my name is Clive Harris, and I'm the IMS Early Program Manager uh, for Europe. And it's been my um, fun and enjoyment over the last few months to be uh, involved in the uh, quality partnership program that has been testing IMS 15. Um, so what I'm hoping to do is give you uh, a brief and rapid run through of the things that have been delivered in IMS 15 before moving on to some of the things uh, for the future. Uh, one thing to say within the presentation, there are a couple of places where there is a statement of direction. So just to say the usual disclaimers that IBM issues about statements of direction and what may or may not happen in the future uh, pertain to this presentation as well. So what am I going to cover? I'm going to cover uh, brief, briefly cover what's new in IMS 15, talk about the fact that even though we were developing IMS 15, there were still program enhancements taking place to IMS 14 alongside. I want to then talk about moving to continuous delivery and then talking about um, the IMS catalogue, and finally talking about a new program that is being uh, launched following the end of IMS 15 for the future to support continuous delivery, and that's the IMS Gold program. So first, uh, a quick look at what's new in IMS 15. It became generally available on October 27th, so barely two weeks ago, and it has lots of new and exciting things within it. Um, so I'm just going to whiz through a few highlights. There's much more in that's been delivered than I'm going to cover, uh, and hopefully you'll be able to use the slides as a, a pointer to things to have a look at after the presentation. So first of all, and I suppose most importantly, is we had the launch of the Z14 in the summer, and the new qualities of service, the new security, the new encryption that came with the Z14 uh, were quite a major step forward in terms of securing people's data. And IMS did its bit by supporting that ZOS data set encryption. Now, as you probably know, that the majority of the support for vSAM and BSAM is provided through uh, DFSMS uh, services. And where we can, we've actually piggybacked on that. So all those IMS data set types, yeah, for example, full function databases that are not OSAM, will be supported, so vSAM will be supported. We've also got a number of uh, data sets that do not contain customer sensitive information, things like the recons, for example, that are also supported uh, in terms of the encryption. At the moment, um, there are three types, uh, WADS data sets, the write heads, uh, FastPath DDBs, and uh, OSAM access method, uh, which are not yet uh, supporting encryption. And the reason for that is, there are kind of non-standard mechanisms, and work is going on at the moment to develop and provide that um, security and encryption over the next few uh, months. So uh, just to give you a quick uh, picture, the, the key thing, I suppose, is the, uh, what's, uh, CP, uh, the CPAFC, so the Central Processor Assist Crypto Function. So this is used for the encryption and decryption. It's allowing us to have encryption at rest. It's having a, allowing us to have encryption in flight, as it were. Uh, and also, you can have, of course, crypto cards that support and assist in that encryption mechanism. So um, we're there on the day the Z14 was there. IMS supported that encryption. Um, you can also get it. it it's, it comes with ZOS 2.3, but in ZOS 2.2, with the appropriate um, PTF on, you can also get some of the features uh, in terms of encryption. So um, IMS 14 can also uh, benefit as well, not just IMS 15, for this pervasive encryption. Uh, I, I don't know any numbers myself, but... Um, it's being, I mean, it's the same mechanism that's being used across the whole of the, of the Z box. And I've not heard anywhere people report horror stories of. Um, okay. In Parvo's uh, presentation yesterday, he, he said that there's almost zero, it's, it's all done at a higher level. I suppose there's, the, the, the highlights were zero um, application um, uh, so for, um, impact, zero application impact. 
The next thing we've done is, um, you know, we're conscious of the fact that people are moving to new kinds of applications, uh, the API economy and mobile support. So what we've expanded is the support for network security credential propagation. So historically and, and traditionally what happened was you would sign on on your, your Windows box with your using LDAP or whatever you were, identify yourself, and then you would typically go through a middle tier, and that middle tier would then pass the information on to IMS and IMS Connect at the back end. And what would happen is that you'd start off being um, Fred Smith, but by the time you got to IMS, you'd just be application one. So it didn't really provide you with the kind of security and tracking that, was, that, that people wanted to have. And so one of the developments in 15 is to actually propagate that original identity across so that we can actually record who truly logged on uh, from the remote system and have that uh, recorded inside of the RMS logs. And uh, just to give you a quick picture of that, so what we have here is, uh, in this case, Jane signing on to some distributed application and authenticates herself. And then both of those identifications and any typically RACF user ID that's, that was substituted in the past are passed forward through IMS Connect and IMS runs the transaction using the, the RACF ID that's been uh, supported or, or used, but we're able to log both credentials. And, and so you can keep a much tighter audit track of what has, um, has taken place. We've also uh, included improvements to allow you to uh, collect RACF statistics, and you can turn a parameter on there. Um, so you can gather some more information about what's happening. And we've also expanded the support for the new RACF special characters. And those of you who probably know, um, there's a lot, you're not stuck to the old um, alphanumeric plus a straightforward special character. You can now use a, a broader range of those. And um, that, of course, enhances the security because the ability to make a more unique uh, password uh, is enhanced. We're also uh, conscious of the fact that um, programming in COBOL or PL1 isn't quite as popular as it used to be, and that people are now starting to use things like Java. And so uh, it has been, and IMS has been enhanced to allow 64-bit support for Java. So that means you, know, you can get uh, a larger Java program. We've also moved to the situation where we don't keep on loading individual JVMs, but the JVMs are allowed to uh, mix and match together, as it were. So that saves you some resources. We've also made it easier to track usage statistics by adding instrumentation into SMF. And the other thing we've done is made it easier for you to actually specify the environment variables. Uh, you know, you used to have to do things by specifying options inside the Proclib member, DFS, JVM, MS, and you then had to use the X options file to point to the Unix system services, and it was quite a complicated process. And typically what people are used to doing if they happen to use Java with batch is using something like the um, STD environment DD statement to specify those kind of options. So essentially what we've done is allowed that. So you can now specify things like the, the path that you need and any kind of variables that you need to kick off your, your Java application in a much more straightforward way uh, than was previously possible using the having to use the, the Proclib member. We've also specified dynamic resource creation. Uh, one of the things that people like to do, I mean, not just for Java, but typically Java programs, they create them, they run them, they, they come and go on a much more frequent basis than some of the more established things. And, and what we've allowed is for BMP and, and Java uh, batch um, processing regions is the situation for you to actually schedule the uh, artifacts that you need that you previously need to put in a stage one gen um, you can actually do those just before you want to, to, to launch the, um, the Java application. So that gives you a much more dynamic and responsive way to implement new Java things. So you don't have to think ahead. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. Dynamic database changes. Uh, one of the, the areas here is to be able to change and alter um, uh, DEDBs, fast paths, to actually add a new field to an existing free space. Um, and we've also allowed you and expanded the support for DDL. Now, you're probably all aware that in IMS 14, uh, the ability to create objects um, using DDL was introduced. Um, and so what we're doing is, as 15 goes forward, enhancing that support for using DDL 
as an alternative to uh, coding the old-fashioned statements and then you know, going through the old-fashioned uh, gen process. Uh, just pictorially, that's what it looks like. You can um, add a new field in. So here we've taken field three and added it into what was previously an undefined area. And the other thing we're doing is we're allowing you to increase the length of one or more variable length segments. So again, it gives you more flexibility. Uh, the idea is, along with all of these changes, is to keep IMS up and running continuously, make it easier for you to do changes on the fly, as it were, um, and therefore improve the availability of your applications and make it simpler to manage as well. In terms of the logger enhancements, um, we've consolidated them into a uh, single location in the DFS, DF, XX, whatever you have in your, um, in your shop. Um, it's become mandatory for IMS 15. We've also produced, uh, we've also using the media manager support WADs and hyperwrite for olds. So we're taking advantage of the new hardware developments that are coming along and making use of things that uh, things like TFSMS are providing for us to actually make a um, better service. We've enhanced the uh, trace commands using type two traces and the um, common shared queues where the situation is if you've got an error, you wouldn't necessarily know where it came from. We've now enhanced it so you can track where the fault actually came and report to you it came from here rather than it came from somewhere in here. ZOSMF workflows, we're taking advantage of those and there are new workflows that have been created. They are available on GitHub, so you can pull them down and then load them up into your own local ZOSMF workflows. And, and as you know, um, ZOSMF provides quite a lot of new features to help you install uh, new IMSs or help you install a new IMS database. And currently there's work going on on a number of fronts and you'll see some more changes in the future. Uh, I know the one that's being uh, looked at quite closely at the moment is uh, support for IMS managed ACBs. But you know, this is a work in progress and as those new workflows become available, so you'll then be able to pick them up, pull them down from, from GitHub or, or wherever, change them according to your local site specifics and then use ZOSMF to deploy them. So that should make the process of maybe deploying a new IMS or deploying a new database a much simpler and more streamlined process using a GUI rather than having to do it the, the old fashioned way. So that is a very, very brief rush through some of the things that came with um, IMS 15. Um, but it's also fair to say that they weren't just doing things for IMS 15 over the last couple of years. They've also been delivering a constant stream of small program enhancements to IMS 14. Uh, and what I've got on the next slide, very busy slide, is just a few, I think there's about 20 there, 20, 25, different things that have been delivered for IMS 14 that you can, you can put on today. Uh, so enhancements to Java, enhancements, for example, the IMS service provider, the, uh, the old IMS mobile features pack has disappeared. You now um, have the IMS service provider, which is delivered inside of ZOS Connect Enterprise Edition. And my next presentation will talk about some of the things that are happening with um, ZOS Connect EE. Um, and we've also done things like um, the IMS catalog directory recovery utility. Um, the you know, IMS catalog is a whole DB database. It is critical. It will be critical to the way you manage uh, IMS. And so, you know, we need to have a kind of cast iron way of making sure that uh, should things go wrong, you can recover it simply and easily. So that's what I was going to say about IMS 14 and IMS 15. Uh, what I want to do now is move on to talking about continuous delivery. So continuous delivery, uh, IBM's uh, Ginny Remitti said that she thought it would be a great idea to have continuous delivery to make the delivery of our software products more agile, more frequent, more responsive to customer needs. And rather than wait every two years and have a big bang and fireworks display when we launch a new version, we have put things out on a much more frequent basis, allowing you to take advantage of those enhancements much sooner than you can do today. So quite often uh, we find that when we come along and say, we've got this really new exciting way to do something, you respond by saying, that would have been good about 18 months ago, but we've already done something to do that. Uh, it's a bit late. Uh, and also new technology comes along. 
uh, if you can imagine, you know, this new technology in the Z14, and us saying to you, will it be about two years before we can let you exploit any of it? And you go, really? Um, surely it'd be possible to make use of it sooner. So the focus will be to deliver the right function or functions at the right time, to deliver things strategically when they're ready. The idea isn't to put things out you know, half finished or half cooked. It's to make sure that when features and functions are delivered, they are delivered as complete features that will work, that won't do anything to damage your environment. And the last focus is to actually involve customers much more in deciding what is the priority. What is the next feature that people are interested in? Uh, rather than uh, taking a stab ourselves, is to ask, ask the customer base, what would you like to see? What would be good for you? So what's been the response to the customers we've asked so far? The sorts of things they're saying is, if you're going to introduce a new function, don't turn it on by default. You know, make us... Make us, give us the control to decide when we actually enable it. Um, and people are happy to deliver it through the service process. So we intend to deliver uh, PTFs that you can download and, and you know, install and then enable when you're happy. Uh, and they're talking about, and this is varying at the moment, every four to six months. I've also heard people talking about delivering it on a monthly or bi-monthly basis. And I think some of that is, is uh, undecided because it's a new process. And also it's undecided because it depends on the feature of the function you're writing, whether it's a, you know, a large new thing or just a, a small enhancement. And it will tie up with RSU levels. So you will be able to, if you're used to applying your updates through being, you know, one or two RSUs a year. I mean, I know, every, I know we say you should do it four times a year. You know, most customers do it two times a year. Uh, and then we want to make sure that the delivery and implementation is consistent with what our uh, colleagues are doing on the other parts of the, um, the Z platform. So why are we doing this? Well, we're doing this um, because IBM released a paper articulating why they want to move to the continuous delivery, why it's important for customers, why it's good to move forward and make things happen more quickly. IMF have chosen to align with this. And the key things from you is it allows you to try out features as they're shipped and provide feedback. Potentially, you could turn a feature on in your, in your sandbox system, test it, turn it off, uh, and you've done no damage. But you've had the chance to actually see how something new works almost as soon as we've created it and made it available. And we have had, over the years, and have built up strong partnerships with customers and with vendors through the Customer Advisory Council, through the quality partnership programs that have been the backbone of, of, of involving customers. And we're going to continue to rely on those partnerships and continue to collaborate with people and you know, strengthen the channels that we have and the communication we have with people on a more frequent basis than we have in the past. And that's something I'll talk about when I come to talking about the RMS Gold program that is uh, being launched. So um, how will it work? I've got, I've got a chart that uh, describes it next. So what we'll do is we'll deliver it through service, through PTFs. Um, we will, uh, when a new release or a new version of RMS is released, the continuous delivery enhancements will, deliver, will be delivered onto that new version. And the previous version will become a long-term release support version and will no longer continue to enhance that. So we'll move forward. And most features will be delivered by default disabled you will have to actually do something to enable them. And, and typically, the type of mechanism we're looking at is having a, a, a Proclib member. Where, so for example, if you think of the DFDS um, Proclib member there, where we've got sections in there to do with turning catalog management on, for example, at the moment, um, there'll be little sections in there that you'll be able to use to enable or disable. But there will also be, in some cases, because of architectural reasons, uh, around things like the foundation issues, where some features will be delivered enabled. But I mean, you'll be flagged about that because sometimes it's not possible to turn something off because of the way that we're putting the Lego bricks together. Correct. So. Just briefly, is, does that mean that, I mean, just out of interest, do you mean that you will be not having version 16 a label per se? I've got version 16 with all these PTFs, but it's just the way you're delivering it is going to be more gradual. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll, what we normally do about now, if this, we'd be announcing iOS 16 in two yeah. years' time. Uh, there's not. Now, there is still some 
details to be worked out about. Um, and I'm using the thing here, versions, releases, and, and versions and releases in the kind of way that we're used to understanding them. But that's not necessarily a version with a big V, uh, if you think of it. So um, what I'm trying to show in the graphic here is here's, here's a, a version and release issued. That will be supported for um, two years plus one. We'll apply PTFs. We'll get to version two. And then we'll move forward to version three and version four. And what will happen is when we get to version one, we'll stop. When we get to version three, we'll stop applying fixes behind. We'll move forward. So effectively, these versions become uh, stabilized as we move forward. Now, obviously, uh, you know, people will be concerned about how quickly do I have to do something before I find that the ground has moved under my feet and I, I'm not ready. So there are, um, you know, there still be the minimum five plus three years support for aversion, even though things are changing in between times. And when we announce the end of service on, on aversion, there'll be at least 12 months notice before that end of service becomes effective. So, um, you know, in terms of the kind of timescales and the availability you have at the moment, it's not such a big change. You know, you're still going to have the ability to, to plan and change. I think the thing that I suppose might change is retrofitting things. If you come along and say, I've got something that's four releases old, are you going to retrofit something into it? And the answer is going to be no. Uh, we're going to be moving forward because we've stabilized that one. So that's um, all I wanted to say about the continuous delivery. You know, um, there will be changes and there will be enhancements and you know, there will be more information coming out. There's a reference to a red paper there. There is also on the RMS website a uh, links to a series of uh, frequently asked questions that have been created to answer all the questions you're thinking, but he didn't talk about this or he didn't mention that. So you can go to the website and hopefully we've thought of most of the things that you're, you, know, you might be concerned about and have some statement in there to you know, assuage you that we have thought about this quite carefully. Yes, and you know, and the vendors are being uh, fully up, up to date and on board, and you know, and the, the key thing, if you think about things like the the uh, QPP program and, and the vendor involvement there, that is absolutely critical that we maintain that and we carry on supporting that, and so there will be um, vendors will be supported in a, a kind of slightly different way, but not not wildly different to the way that um, we're thinking about that the customers will get involvement with the design thinking which um, I'll cover when I talk about the IMS Gold program. So the next thing I want to talk about is the IMS catalogue. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's a bit strange, isn't it? Because the IMS catalogue came out in version 12, I think, didn't it? And everybody moved rapidly forwards to implement it and use it and um, Everything was good, but only not many people did move forward, or not as many as we hoped would move forward to implementing the catalogue. But really what I want to do is update you now about where we are going with the catalogue and to make it clear to you that you know, this is a strategic direction um, for IMS going forward. So just a quick recap at the moment. Um, the way that people uh, generate things, so you may well, or hopefully you do use the IMS Explorer, to help you in the process of creating your PSBs and your DVDs. You then put them through a standard PSB gen or an ACB uh, a DVD gen. Then you put them through uh, an ACB gen process. And if you're already using the catalog, you then populate your catalog with the catalog utility. And you've got both artifacts. You've got an ACB lib, and you've still got the active and inactive ACB libs. And you've got the catalog as well. Uh, and a lot of people have, you know, have got that far and are you know, trying that out. The, the driver for the IMS catalog is really to help um, people like application developers access IMS data. So if you are uh, a developer and you want to know the format of a particular segment, it's quite difficult with IMS because quite often the thing that defines the segment is a copybook. And so they have to search around for a copybook to match it up to the segment. And then they have to make sure they've got the right copybook uh, the most recent copybook. And so where the IMS Explorer comes in, it helps you with, it's a GUI interface to allow you to match those things up. You also can actually define 
start to define fields. So you can keep a record inside of your DBE, not just of the key fields, but also of all the other fields. So you're not just reliant upon a, making sure you've got the latest copy book from a, a PDS member somewhere that's been stored away through your um, version control software. And so um, it has tremendous benefits in terms of being able to do uh, using SQL and some of the uh, newer things like uh, QMF, for example. QMF can now access IMS databases, but it needs to have some way of mapping the content in the segment to what you get back. And so at the moment, what you have to do if you haven't got um, anything to do with the catalog or you haven't got any of these things in place is you have to create a little side file and then install it into Explorer and then keep that up to date. But if you can use the catalog, you then have that information captured centrally and it's available for everybody centrally to be able to interrogate. Uh, so those are, you know, those are the, that's the benefits we're looking forward so the next stage forward is, in my um, slide here, is you turn on uh, ACB management to be done through the catalog. And so what happens is, instead of creating your PSB source or your DBD source, you start using DDL. So, you know, IMS 14, we had our, uh, DDL come along to create almost all of the, um, the artifacts that are available. And it looks kind of similar to those of you who are used to DB2, looks kind of similar to the DDL that you would use to create a database or a table inside of um, DB2. But obviously there are unique characteristics in it because IMS isn't DB2 and there are things that we want to specify that, that simply don't exist in, in DB2. Uh, and we've got the IMS Explorer and vendor tools are providing ways of actually allowing you to create DDL or access the catalogue. And in fact, inside of the catalog structure, there is a segment type reserved for vendor use. So vendors can actually put some of their information into uh, your catalog to help assist you with maybe some things that they're doing. Uh, and so we also make use of the directory in Bootstrap and you'll notice there's no PSB or DBDs involved, there's no ACB gen involved. And typically what people are doing at the moment is they've started to do ACB management, but they're still maintaining this alternative route. So they're actually, uh, you know, belt and braces, I suppose you'd call it. Um, we've, we're doing it the old way, but hopefully taking advantage of some of the new enhancements that come with managed ACBs. So um, the prerequisites for it, it's required for online, and it's a HALDB database which must be enabled and uh, because it uses type 2 commands, then you need to make sure that the common service layer and uh, the, the different address spaces in there, not all of the address spaces, but um, just those two address spaces are enabled. And there's a typo on my slide. Uh, what's not required, you've not required it for batch and offline utilities. Um, you don't need DBRC to enforce control uh, in a test environment. Why would you not do it anyway? But some people do not necessarily turn on DBRC below production but I would never run um, with DBLC off. Um, and at the moment, ACB gens will continue to be available. DDL is not required, it's optional, and, and IMS Connect is, again, you know, an optional thing. But going forward, uh, within the last couple of months, we have actually issued a, a statement of direction about where we're going with managed ACBs. And uh, the key bit, really, is the section I've highlighted in here is that we will, in the future, require you to use IMS management of ACBs. It won't be something that you can choose to use because it's nice to have. It'll be something that will be uh, required. And the IMS catalog must be set up to support managed ACBs. And there is tooling and utilities that will be developed to allow you to do that and move forward. Um, so it won't be, uh, we're changing the rules and you're on your own. It'll be, we're changing the rules and here are the tools that we've given you to help you um, move forward. And um, at some point in the future, after that's in place, we intend to remove the um, generation processes for PSBs, DBDs and ACBs. So uh, at that time, the catalog, SQL and DDL will become de facto, the way to create and change your PSBs and DBDs. And how much notice do you think you would give customers? Uh, well, we're going back to the continuous delivery. Um, 
you know, you, you'd get quite a lot of notice upon this. You know, I suspect typically we say something in version X and then version X plus one or two, we say it's really coming and it gets to, you know, version X plus three, it's happened. At the moment, I can't tell you the answer to that question. It's still being worked on you know, the, you know, the actual mechanics of the time scale for doing it. And what we're really doing at the moment is saying to you, it's a heads up. You know, the next stage will make managed ACBs uh, compulsory. And the next stage after that will be to move away from generating PSBs and DVDs and ACBs the way you have been doing in the past. So you've got a day or two. Seriously, no, you've got um, much longer than that. <laughs> but it, it is still being worked on. And you, know, you will get lots of notice. Uh, I know that this has been talked through at great length uh, and a number of discussions with the QPP uh, participants over the last six months. And you know, their suggestions and uh, comments have been taken on board by the labs. And in fact, some of the plans have been altered to reflect the concerns and you know, thoughts that uh, the QPP customers are having. The QPP customers, surprisingly, have also decided that as well as looking at the new things in IMS 15, they've been doing a bit of testing of managed ACBs as well. Uh, and the results are, you know, are, are encouraging. I think it's just because it's, just it's something new and it's, it's, you're going to have to do it rather than not do it. Um, but I think the advantages in terms of opening up IMS for the future, opening up IMS for developers, releasing the data that's held in IMS, so we, we get away from this draining it out of IMS and sending it somewhere else so that we can access it. Hopefully it's you know, a way of giving uh, you know, IMS a, a way to move forward, a, a modern interface. And also, if you think about it from a, from a DB2 perspective, um, almost everybody I know now will always go to the catalogue for the definitive source of what's actually happening in their system. They won't say to you, oh, well, there's a, um, there's a PDS member over there and some data set that I think you know, Jane kept from when we did this last time. I think that's the right one to use. And then, of course, it isn't, and you corrupt something. So you know, it will become second nature to go to the catalogue to say what's really there. And, and be the trusted source, whether you're developing new stuff, whether you're a DBA administering stuff. Uh, and I think that would be a very positive thing. So the other things, uh, some of the other reasons, the value really of doing it is we're trying to get away from cisgens because cisgens are kind of like, it stops your system. Maybe not for very long, but it stops your system and it starts your system. We want to get away with that. Uh, and we'd like to actually see uh, a situation and some of the stuff we talked about in IMS 15 where we're being able to do program creates where you know you don't have to do a stage one gen up front before you can bring up a, a you know a new program because you can do it dynamically all those things are working together in concert towards that uh, situation the IMS directory is a, a PDSE um, and I haven't put the benefits on the next page unfortunately but really that's about um, managing the PDSEs because in terms of extent management and space management, it can, it can manage itself. And so we don't have one less thing to worry about. And uh, you submit your DDL. And when the DDL is executed, you're done. So the number of steps you have to go through at the moment in order to create a new database can be 10, 12, 14 steps. And we'll be taking maybe the first six or eight steps of setting up the DDL and compressing those into create the DDL. So it simplifies your life. Um, operational improvements, because it becomes a simple process. Hopefully, that leads to uh, improved productivity because it's um, a better understood process. Um, there is a question about skills issues. Now, I mean, I, I've worked with both IMS and do work with both IMS and DB2. Uh, and it's a way of um, leveraging the skills that may exist. So um, trying to make people uh, multilingual, I suppose, in terms of IMS and DB2. And um, modernizing, I've talked about. And um, we're not, in play, no, not intending to have uh, the equivalent of a cat maint. Now, I know um, DB2 users love cat maints. And um, there's not the intention to have uh, you know, catalog migrations. So that will be one pain point that you won't have to uh, experience. So that's all I was going to say about um, managed ACBs and the RMS catalog. I'll stop at that point. Um, if there's any questions people have, well, actually, there are lots of questions I'm sure people have in their head. I don't quite understand that last point. The driver is. My well, knowledge of the catalogue is very you know, material. 
So in terms of DB2 over the years, what they've done is they've restructured the catalogue uh, in terms of the actual database type that it's supplied in and you know, the actual internal structure and whether it uses pointers or whether it uses DB2 mechanisms. And so quite often, the actual upgrade of from one DB2 to another DB2 is quite a complex process in terms of sorting out your catalog and verifying your catalog is correct and being restructured and uh, if there's internal reorganizations to be done. And, and that is or has been a, a point of um, some failures and some, some, you know, some angst when people have been up, updating or moving from one version of DB2 to another version of DB2. Our intention is not to do that kind of thing. Now, it's difficult to say never, ever, but the sorts of things that have been going on in terms of the way that the catalog for DB2 has evolved over the years, the intention is to learn from what's happened in the past and to make sure that you, know, you don't have to repeat history. Um, so it should be, uh, when you come to upgrade, a, a, a clean process and a, a straightforward process that doesn't involve a kind of magic black arts and uh, you know, boxes and things like that. Um, and that's what you want when you're upgrading. You want, a, you want a straightforward system. You want something that's clean, easily understood, easily maintained and easily implemented. So I'll move on to the IMS Gold program. So you are some of the first, the first few people in the world, I think, to actually hear about this uh, new program. Uh, and first of all, someone said, so why is it called the IMS Gold program? And the answer is IMS is 50 years old next year. I think, on, I think somebody said it was the 14th of August yesterday, someone was saying. Um, and so I don't know, uh, you know, in the UK, you have your golden wedding anniversary or your golden this, that, or the other. So somebody said, that's a good idea. We'll call it the IMS Gold Programme because IMS is 50 years old. And it's, uh, what we're looking to do here is saying, OK, so we're going to move to continuous delivery away from what we're doing. Um, but we're also employing design thinking. And the way in which the labs are actually moving towards agile, uh, agile um, coding is they're now starting to use that design thinking process and, and changing to be more and more customer focused in terms of who decides or what leads where we're going. So um, they're looking at situations where they specify what's the situation today, what's the as is situation. Um, and typically things get put in a queue and they stay there and we get limited feedback. You know, we might hear a lot from systems programmers or DBAs, but maybe not hear very much from developers. So maybe some of the things that people are shouting about are wanted by one part of the community, but actually the development community, which could really do with maybe some enhancements, their voices may be uh, more softer than those from elsewhere. It's based on traditional um, delivery of code techniques. And, and we tell you what we've done at the end. And it's all a big secret until we get to the end. Now and again, we slip things out. But generally, you know, what's been happening in IMS 15 has been under the wraps until we announce it. And there's a kind of disconnect or potential for disconnect. Uh, and the other thing that happens is uh, we deliver a new feature or a new function, which we think people want. But actually, when it comes out, potentially somebody's saying, well, that's OK, but actually uh, it kind of must have got lost in translation because what we really thought you were going to do is we thought you were going to do this, but actually what you've done is that, which is almost right, is almost what we wanted, but not quite. So the, the 2B situation, what we're going to work towards developing is better management of requirements, and I've got a slide coming along about how that requirements process will, will change to get feedback from a wider group of people in the community to use continuous delivery and design thinking methodologies to um, design the products, to capture feedback from users, to have the concept of sponsored users. So, you know, you will hear what's coming along and then you will offer to help, co in a sense, co-develop the, uh, the new feature with us by becoming early, uh, early testers or, or early sponsors of that. And the, cl and the collaboration will take place right from the beginning of the inception of a new feature right the way through to the delivery of that uh, feature or function through a PTF into the service stream. It will also mean that we can deliver things as the market wants them. We don't have to wait a two or three years before we can deliver something new. We can deliver something uh, you know, in a shorter time frame. And if there's a strategic new development elsewhere that we can take advantage of, we can deliver that as well. 
And finally, we will hopefully, be, be, by being much closer to what customer needs are and because the customers will see how it's evolving as it's being created, we should end up in a situation where the functionality that is delivered is first of all complete uh, and is also what you want. Uh, and there is, you know, that's the aim, is to deliver what you want in a timely and effective manner to help you uh, exploit your investment in IMS. So what does the, the, the gold uh, program offer? Uh, continuous customer engagement, uh, design thinking, and that's your involvement in a design thinking process that the, the labs are already involved in, and then uh, one or two um, extra experiences to uh, help you know more what's going on. So to expand it, the continuous customer experience will become involving the um, what was the Customer Advisory Council and the QPP, the, the former QPP involvements, will then be looking to expand that to other clients and other customers as well. And um, in a situation where once you've seen something you're interested in, you'll become a sponsored or you can become a sponsored user and become more intimately involved in the development of a particular feature or function, it will hopefully provide greater engagement. And the design thinking, what we're doing there is to use um, case-driven things. Now, here's a scenario, here's the current situation, what would we like it to be in the future? How do we get from here to there? And we'll use playbacks and the design thinking methodologies to say, we've developed this, we'll play it back to you. Is this right? You know, have we interpreted what you're saying correctly? And then we deliver when we're ready, which may be a month or two after you've started, or maybe a bit longer, depending on what you're doing. Uh, and finally, um, we're going to be looking at uh, improving the um, enhancements process. So there are a number of kind of layers of, you know, levels of, of, of kind of involvement. So we've got all RMS customers down here. Um, and there is a, a Z-wide client feedback program that's been initiated by Mike Pereira that covers kicks and IMS. I think it's going to cover DB2, MQ, the AD development tools. And the idea is that you will sign up once to this um, process. It'll be an evergreen agreement, so it won't expire. It effectively provides you with the confidentiality clauses that will allow you to be told what's coming on in the future on a very regular basis. Um, the the timescales haven't been involved, but it could be you know, every two to three weeks we have a call and everybody's told the call's taking place, the subject for this week's call is I mismanaged ACBs. And they'll be able to dial in, the developers will be there talking about what they're planning or what's coming next or receiving feedback on what they've done. Uh, and you'll be able to you know, interact with them on an on ongoing basis. Uh, and potentially, if you're interested in getting more involved, indicate that you want to become a sponsored user and then get involved in you know, the nitty gritty of the design and development of that particular uh, feature or function. And uh, this is where you move up, if you like. And then finally, at the end, what we're hoping is that uh, people will be uh, keen to, um, to share their experiences, keen to say uh, how much they uh, enjoyed uh, getting involved in the process and helping to um, deliver a new feature and um, you know, act. Rather than just have me stand here all the time saying IBM is wonderful, we'll have you standing here saying IBM is wonderful as well. So what's the timeline? So uh, already, and I've been involved in it myself, the first wave of communication to uh, typically the Customer Advisory Council and the QPP participants uh, has already started. Uh, and you know, the back end of this year, there'll be a second wave of, of information to people who've signed up. Uh, and then in, uh, actually it's now gonna be March rather than February, there'll be uh, a meeting in the US where we're trying to get to people together for the first time to, you know, if you like, kind of kick off the uh, program. And then running forward, there will be um, quarterly calls head by the, uh, headed up by the uh, offering management uh, team. And then in the second half of the year, we will get uh, a meeting in Europe, similar to the meeting that, uh, that will be taking place in, in the US in, in March. And so the process will then roll around in terms of the way in which the program will be kept up to date. The RBM Z client feedback program, it's uh, an online click and accept agreement. You only have to do it once. 
And once you've actually uh, signed on using your IBM ID, which is the, becoming the common way of uh, identifying yourself to IBM for various things, um, and you've agreed to accept the agreement, you'll tell us about your capture, your areas of interest. At the moment, you know, if you're, if you're uh, company X and you're interested in IMS and Kix and DB2 and AD tools, you have to sign on all these different programs that are all happening at a different time. Uh, and somebody's going, I've already signed this. I've signed up for one of these. Oh, no, you didn't. You signed up for the IMS one and not the DB2 one. And we're trying to simplify and streamline all of that. So once you've signed the one agreement, you'll then indicate your areas of interest. And based on what area of interest you've ticked, you'll then be contacted by the various uh, you know, IBM people behind the scenes to say, hello, welcome, we hear you've uh, expressed an interest in finding out more about IMS. Here's some details about our next call. Please come and join us. The subject will be X. And then you'll be involved in those regular, uh, you know, I say monthly, but regular uh, web conferences or e-meetings. I'm not sure what you actually call them. And um, there is a link there so you can read more about how the um, program is working. So... Um, why join it? So the, re the reason, why would you want to join it? So you get a sneak preview of what we're up to. But more than that, you get an opportunity to participate and influence the way that the future is actually going to be created. And what takes priority? What comes before this? What comes after that? It's a, it's a, it's a single once-off signing agreement. Um, and it allows you to join all the various different IBM Z offerings. And you know, once you've clicked an interest, you will get information from those various pillars. And, and you control which activities you take part in. You may decide that initially you just want to join the kind of call when it takes place, get an update, hear what's coming down the line, and that's it. And then you know, a month later, you come back and say, oh, they're doing topic two, but they're also giving a bit of feedback about what happened last month. And you may be happy about that until something sparks your interest, and then you say, I'd like to get more involved in that. Um, so that's how um, the process will work. The exact frequency of the, the meetings is yet to be determined. And part of that is it is a kind of continuous delivery process for us as well. We're trying something new. We're trying something, see what happens, and then adjust and change what happens to reflect our experiences, our common experiences of running those early calls. On requests for enhancements, um, People sometimes think that they make a request for enhancements and it goes into a box and that box is hidden somewhere in a corner behind someone's desk and no one ever looks at it. And um, the idea being is that we want to change that uh, perception of the request for enhancements process and build it into the way in which we're changing the design process and the, the new continuous delivery of IMS. So the commitment is to review and respond to RFEs within eight weeks of you opening them. And then um, the voting capability for people to actually uh, say which ones they'd like to support or which ones they, they think are important. Uh, and once it's been accepted, and of course, like everything else, there will be criteria about you know, what will be accepted, why will, it, why will it not be, not rejected, but not proceeded with at the current moment or maybe put to one side. But once it's been accepted, the aim will be to deliver within 18 months to two years. Now, if you ask for a really big enhancement, then it's going to be kind of 18 months to 24 months. If you ask for a smaller enhancement, it could be a month or two away, maybe three months away. It depends. So, so finally, uh, I just want to summarize, um, you know, IMS 15 is um, an evolution in IMS. It is the last time you will do a version-to-version -version migration, as you've always been used to doing them, or skip releases, depending on what your, um, your methodology is, because we are moving to a continuous delivery mon uh, model. And you, more importantly, you won't need to wait to the next version to get that feature or function you've heard about that's important to you. Um, I forgot to mention earlier, but I think it's important to say that although IMS 15 only went uh, GA in, in, you know, at the back end of last month, there are already three customers, two in Europe and, and one in the States, uh, who are actually running IMS in production, IMS 15 in production, and have been running IMS 15 in production 
uh, I think at least a month, month to two months before the GA date. And that's something we've always managed to achieve with IMS, is to get that code up and running in a production environment and you know, with some big customers to prove the quality and the feedback we've had from the customers in the QPP program is that they liked what they saw, they were um, pleased with the quality of the code, uh, and that commitment, I think, is demonstrated by them moving to using um, IMS 15 in production, uh, even before it's generally available to, um, to order more widely. Uh, and secondly, we're moving to change the way we engage with clients, moving to a model where we engage lots of different clients, developers, DBAs, sysprogs, those kind of are the obvious audience, but maybe some architects as well, maybe some people haven't thought of, maybe some data scientists. So we get a much rounder picture of what people are doing in their shop with IMS and how we can respond. Uh, and then the opportunity to join, join the IMS Gold program and if you like become, you know, more formally, maybe is the wrong word, but, but more intimately involved with the process of IMS being delivered in the future. So uh, my final comments really is, IMS 15 is here, it's available now, you can get it today. So my question is, when are you going to start migrating? So thank you for listening. I have to say at this point, to remind you that your session feedback is welcomed. You can scan the barcode, you can use a pencil and a piece of paper, a quill if you have one. Um, and so thank you for your attention. And if there are any last questions, I'll be happy to take them now. version 1, version 2, version 3. Yeah. So the last full version we'll migrate to is version 15. Yeah. Then after that, it'll be what PTFs that you would apply? Uh, there may be SPEs. I mean, at oh, the moment, it would okay. be principally through the service streams, PTFs, but there may be situations where, you know, a bigger package is, is, is delivered. Okay. And then at some stage, when we've applied certain changes, do you then call that the version 16? Or how does that work? No. Okay. No. Though, the, 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 I mean, there will come a point, what they're talking about, there will come a point after some PTFs are being arranged where it may be the case that uh, you, you, because you can enable or disable things or rather not enable things, it may become a point where we have to deliver something that is enabled, which means that you, in practical terms, you have to move from being here to being there because in order to move forward, yeah. you need to have kind of changed your, 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 your foundation layer or the, you know, the, the, the base. Um, and at the moment, because of the way that it's just evolving, uh, there isn't a clear way of saying, right, and that will happen in six months' time, or, mm -hmm. or that one happen in three months' time. And I know, um, you know my colleague from CA here, I mean, your experiences of continuous delivery is, you know, situations sometimes occur where you then need to move forward and everybody can't keep on. You have to enable something and then move forward rather than simply saying, I'm not going to take this, I'm not going to take this, I'm not going to take this. Sorry? How would you know if you've applied everything that you should have at that point? In order well, because we're going to use SMPE. So, you know, the right. standard SMPE process, when you, when you take your PTF, I mean, if there's co-requisites and prerequisites, then in the way that if you pull in the PTF today, then SMPE will go away and pull all the requisite maintenance, will tell you about all the other things that need to be developed. So, so that mechanism isn't new, and that's, you know, tried and yeah, tested. Yeah. And, you know, the mechanisms for accepting and applying and, and all those kind of things will remain as, you know, as SMPE is today. So you get that level of assurance and control that you're used to, have been used to having for, for, for you know, yeah. ages. Okay. I think also this kind of, it, it, the version of release thing is, um, it's just, you can just a change a headset really, because what we're, you know, instead of saving things up for, you know, two or three years and then delivering a big splurge of things, what we'll be delivering is, you know, something new or something different, something better, you know, every you know, month, every two months, every three months, uh, which, which will hopefully make it easier for you to actually implement them. Because if you're going to move from, you know, moving from version 13 to 15 or 14 to 15 is considered by many shops to be a major activity yeah. Yeah. that, you know, you have to devote, you know, two or three, your only sysprogs to it. Everything else has to stop whilst you do it. Uh, and then it's, you know, then you roll it out across 497 production systems and development systems and mm -hmm. all the other systems. And then it's two years later and you start again. Yes. Um, and you, you, you know, That's and what we're, doing, yeah. and we're hoping to move away from that. So it becomes, you know, it becomes no more onerous to 
apply a new feature that somebody's been asking for, then putting a PTF on, and then enabling it. Yes, you will have to test it. Everybody will test it. But doing that is an entirely different level of, of, of involvement to rolling out a, a, a new release as we've been used to doing over the last 50 years. So is it possible then that there could be PTFs or SMPs that certain installations don't apply ever? So that's why when I said that, you know, there will be the situation where things will be delivered enabled because, you know, if we're going to change it, if the arch underlying architecture changes or develops, and then there might well be the situation where you have to do something. You can't decide not to do something because you know, the future depends on you having gone from position X to position Y. Like when you make, um, I, I mismanaged like mismanage ACBs, for example. Here's a very good example. Um, <laughs> So, so we're already seeing, you know, there will be situations where um, you'll be politely told, you know, you have to do it. Because um, it seems to me quite good if at a certain point down the line you can say, right, we're going to call this version 16, and that is, you know, version 15 with these PTS, these SMPs, and then, you know, you put a sort of baseline, mm. because it must be very hard to, uh, you know, for you to, to support customers who are on, who are on completely different versions. Yes. So that's what we're talking about, the long-term release, uh, you know, where... I, on a few slides ago, I talked about this long-term release thing, but I, I think it's you know this is all you know. I think you know your comments and feedback to the labs are helpful there because what we want to make sure is you clearly understand the process, you clearly understand when you're doing something, so that you know potentially what impact it, it has on your shop before you do it. Uh, and I, I think it's quite difficult to kind of merge the old nomenclature of versions and releases and and things with the new concept of of something that's it's not really a version, but it's moved you forward. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm with Wendy on this. I think I can see the benefit of having a baseline and saying what it is. That's what I was trying to say earlier on as well. That if you said 60, but if you, if you do it in the way you're going to do it, which hmm. obviously with the iterations, that's, you still get all those benefits, but then you still got at least a... You can still say a baseline yeah. of, of yeah. a certain is 16, but, but it's going to be like two point. You, if different shops aren't going to be able to compare no. with no. each other. No. But then they can't at the moment, not, sort of, can they? No, but, but at least, you know, you used to say, well, who's on version 15, who's on version... Yeah. And, yeah. and the hands go up and, and yeah. everybody kind of knows yeah. Yeah. What, what, what other shops are looking at. Now, that, you're right, it's not a big benefit particularly. But um, certainly, it might make things easier for for at least people to say, well, okay, we've got a baseline of here, we've got a baseline here. And I suppose the other thing is that, I mean, Barclays, we're not the best of exploiting new things. So I think we're going to be in the position where we're always dragging our feet and probably going to have to mm. upgrade to the new one anyway. But it might. But then you. But you could well be in a situation where, you know, so because... still going to have to upgrade hmm. things. But you might be in a situation where, you know, we've delivered something your developers are really interested in yeah. that stands alone, can be enabled, yes. comes disabled, and you can enable it. And in order to bring that piece of functionality to them, you don't have to do an across-the-board upgrade of everything that moves. No, no, you can just yeah. apply that PTF or maybe a small piece of code yeah delivers that for them straight away, even though, in fact, you know, the, one, the things that we've been telling you about in releasing in the last six months, you've not enabled, you've not, maybe you've not even bothered to you know, apply them. Um, but you don't have to. It, it, you, know, you can just pick that up. And so that yeah, gives you yeah, so much more flexibility. For, you know, sort of two or three years down the line, you've got different bits of IMS enabled in every different user, and nobody's yeah. really on a, mm. on a level pegging. And, and there are enhancements that came out two years ago that everybody's forgotten about. And, oh, we should be using that maybe, but we don't yeah. know it's there anymore. So, you know, see, so, just trying to keep up to date with yeah. what's available and not enough enabled within your, yes. within your environment yeah. is it's going to be more difficult to keep track of. And I know that's been recognised and acknowledged, and I know people are already, you know, working on how... So, so the, the gold program and the Z client feedback program are ways of keeping you in, up to date with what's happening, you know, in, 
in real time, as it were, or slightly, you know, uh, slightly after. Um, and I think it's fair to say that, that things are subject to change and, and feedback. And I know that there's a willingness in, in the labs to say, you know, continuous delivery and the changing to Agile is, is a new experience for them as well. So they're, you know, they're having, you know, kind of a change, ch change their lives, you know. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I don't sure. think that would interfere with the actual yeah. benefits that you're no. offering. So I think that's the thing you should, you know, uh, you know, please do, you know, feed that. I mean, I'll, I can feed that back for you, but do, you know, take the opportunity to feed that back to, you know, your contacts or the lab advocates you've got, you know, um, and raise it with them. Because I know that Skyler, as lab director, is is very keen to move towards continuously. Is very keen to actually say, let's let's make IMS, you know, attractive. Uh, for new things that come along rather than kind of being behind the curve. But uh, she's also conscious that, you know, it is the workhorse behind, behind a lot of major systems. And, you know, yeah. 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 And, it, and if, if I said that everybody's got all the answers to how it's going to happen in the future, I'd be lying today mm -hmm. um, because they don't, but they're working on it. And the kind of feedback that you have and your thoughts will help make that process better. So, so thank you all. Any other questions for anyone or comments? You said um, the new features are going to be the same. We typically do bad feedback. Sorry, I, my hearing's not so good, so we I need to... We typically deliver everything at the RSU level. Hmm. Um, the new features which need to be enabled, are we going to have to sit through them on a PTF by PTF basis or could there be some summary that these are the new features with this RSU tag you need to do this to get them all in? I don't know. I mean, obviously... You know, when the PTF comes out, there'll be information yeah. together with it, and I know they're looking at how they can also communicate what's in it. Or you know, this is not just um, you know fixing some problem; it's yeah. actually a a new feature, and it's come disabled. So yes, there will be some notification so that you you can plan and design what you want to turn on or turn off, yeah. or turn on, I should say. Yeah. yeah. So, so thank you all for your time. As I said, um, uh, Dominic would be pleased if you'd fill in the, um, the feedback yeah, forms. Definitely scan them in from the QR code there. And um, if not failing that, do the paper form if you must. Um, <laughs> and the next session is in uh, upstairs in the Wellington B again. So with that. And the bad news is it's me again. But the good news is it's my last session. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Bye -bye.